In your Bible, Ezekiel chapter number 22, the book of Ezekiel and the 22nd chapter, the subject I talked to you about it and promoted it a time or two, masculinity and God's plan for the man, God's plan for man. If you find Ezekiel 22, stand to your feet with me and we'll read it together. An extended passage here beginning in verse number 23 of Ezekiel chapter 22. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, say unto her, Thou art the land that is not cleansed, speaking of the land of Israel, nor reigned upon in the day of indignation. There is a conspiracy of her prophets. And you will notice that he now is speaking to the prophets. And he says, They're like a roaring lion ravening the prey. The prophets have devoured souls. They've taken the treasure and precious things from the people. They have made her many widows in the midst thereof. And then he speaks to the priest. Her priests have violated my law and profaned my holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and the profane. Look at that phrase. I'm not preaching on that. But a, a culture that puts no difference between the holy and the profane. Can't make any distinction between the secular and the sacred. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean. And they've hid their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I am profaned among them. Boy, a picture of America literally there today. Verse 27 He talked about the prophets in 25. He speaks about the priests in 26. Now the princes, the governmental leaders. Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves, ravening the prey to shed their blood and to destroy souls and to get dishonest gain. And then back to the prophets. Her prophets have daubed them with untempered mortar, seeing vanity and divining lies unto them. Thus saith the Lord God when the, people, when the Lord hath not spoken. The prophets say, thus saith the Lord, and God has not spoken to them. He really is hard on the prophets, the priests, the religious leaders here, isn't he? He's taking them to task. And then he speaks about the people, verse 29. The people of the land have used oppression. They've exercised robbery. They have vexed the poor and the needy, and they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. And then the text, I sought for a man among them. All those categories, prophets, priests, princes, people. I sought for a man among all those different categories of people that would make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, and I found none. And therefore have I poured out my indignation, my judgment upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord God. And you may be seated. And Heavenly Father, I pray today that you will give me uh, a special wisdom as I speak on this extremely important subject of you seeking for a man and finding none. Speak to our hearts, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want you to picture an ancient city, and the city has walls around it, but there are gaps in the walls. In places, the walls have been broken down, and there's a call goes out for men to come, strong men, brave men, courageous men, for those men to come and stand in the gap to make up the hedge. Because if nobody's standing in the gap, then invaders will enter into that city and they will destroy the city. I think that is a type, a picture today of the United States of America as it is today. The walls have broken down. The walls of integrity, the walls of morality, the walls of finance, 
the walls of family, the walls of common sense have broken down, and God is looking for men to stand in the gap. It's a sad statement that he makes at the end of verse number 30. You may want to note it in your Bible again. I sought for a man that would make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, but I found none. The men wouldn't respond. The men wouldn't stand up. The men were passive, passive men, men concerned about their own affairs rather than the affairs of Almighty God and the preservation of the culture and the land around them. Now, to stand in the gap required courage. To stand in the gap re required strength. To stand in the gap required sacrifice. You'd have to put aside your own agenda. To stand in the gap requires unselfishness, that your priorities take second place to the priorities of the Creator who made you. You know, I think something very strange has happened in America because we're living in a day where men have been devalued by the entire culture. Men have been devalued as men in the culture. It started with the feminist movement in the 1960s. Gloria Steinham and Bella Abzug and uh, those famous, infamous women who led the women to revolt against uh, their very God-ordained position. And they actually, back then, I don't know if you remember it or not, but I'm old enough to remember it. They said, men are not even necessary anymore. Now, we now have sperm banks. We can store the sperm, and we can even reproduce without men. So we don't even need men anymore. That was the cry of the feminist movement. And that negative stereotype of men, I think, has continued, passed on by our wonderful friends in the media in America. And they've continued to perpetuate that. And that's a lie. That's a lie from the devil. If men were not necessary, God would not have made men. And so we're now facing several decades of negative stereotypes of men, men demonized and belittled as men, as males. But I actually think it's deeper than the culture because I think something has happened with, within the hearts of men themselves. I've I spent more time on this message, this series, than anything I, I've spent time on in a long time. I tried to think it through as a preacher and a, as a man. <laughs> and I tried to think it through as a man who has spent several decades studying the Word of God. And so I want to paint for you the state of men in America. I want to tell you what the state of men in America is, and, and I'm going to depart from the Bible here just just to take a look at men as they are in America today, because men are falling behind in many really key areas. And I don't know if you've thought about it, but you really need to think about what I'm going to be saying. Let's take the field of education first. You've heard that boys do better in math and science, and girls do better in verbal skills. That's always been the common uh, belief. Now, girls do better than boys in every academic discipline. It's not, though, that girls have improved. It's that the scores of boys have declined. Well, why is that? Well, universities we know today are hotbeds of anti-male sentiment. Women's studies programs teach students to see men and boys as entitled and oppressive. As of 2017, women aged 18 through 24 earn more than two-thirds of all master's degrees. Of every 100 men earning a master's, that means 167 women earn one. Why are men falling so far behind in education? 
Go to the media area. In the media, the Kaiser Family Foundation, which I think you know is a very reputable group, they came up with this figure. In 8 to 18-year-olds, 8 to 18-year-olds spend more time with media that would include social media, video games, television programs, movies. 8 to 18-year-old men spend more time with media than any other activity except sleeping. Think about that that boys are spending more time watching social media, TV, movies, whatever, than any other activity in their life except sleeping. How different from the boyhood that I grew up with. I had a broomstick for a pony, and I had a six-shooter, and we played cowboys and Indians, and you don't know how many cowboys I've killed in my day, but you don't know how many times I've been killed either, you know. And uh, it didn't make criminals out of us. And then we played war, and then we played football in football season and baseball in baseball season. And we were outside all the time, and we got dirty, and we rolled in the grass and felt the ground And I never saw a video in my whole life until I was 40 years old. So there's a big change when the boys are spending more time in front of a screen than they are being boys. No wonder we're falling behind in some areas here. Psychguides.com, a website, says one in five Internet searches today on a mobile device is for pornography. One out of five searches. More than 90% of all Internet downloads are related to pornography among some age groups. From sitcoms to comic books to television to social media, men are portrayed negatively. Just think of the sitcoms, and I, can't even, I couldn't even come up with the num- name of a sitcom because I don't watch sitcoms anymore. But for those of you who do, uh, three's a company, or Freddy, or whatever his name was. Men in sitcoms are almost exclusively portrayed as dumb, angry goofballs, unreliable, irresponsible, bumbling doofuses. You never see a nicely dressed, groomed, intelligent, wise, figure in sitcoms, he's the butt of all the jokes. It's always somebody else who is the strong figure there. It's even going to the level of our comic books where our superheroes now are being feminized, and our children's books now are all proclaiming gender gender neutrality. Let's go to the mental health area. Life expectancy started decreasing five years before COVID. The CDC, the Center for Disease Control, blames it on, they say that life expectancy decreasing is because of suicide, drug overdoses, and increased liver disease from alcohol consumption. Between the ages of 15 and 19, boys kill themselves four times more than girls. Between the ages of 20 and 24, it's six times the rate, six times the rate of girls committing suicide. We know about the explosive growth of the percentage of homosexuality in our culture. And we've lowered the bar for mental illness so low, we now consider it normal for a boy to think he's a girl and for a girl to think she's a boy. And now, for people to identify as animals. Do you know we have kids in our schools who think they're a cat? Who meow at people when they're approached? Who carry cat paraphernalia with them to school? And this is not abnormal? Do you know I'm telling you the truth? 
This is reality. Reality is not where you live. Where you and I live is a very special place comparatively to the whole nation. I'm describing the culture at large. And this is what now is normality. And let's go to the area of family. Because the family is the one who suffers the collateral damage. And I'll just deal with one area, not to mention the toll of divorce and a whole bunch of other areas for the limits of my time. I just want to talk about the effect of fatherlessness in the home. One in three children live today in America without a father's presence in their life full time. Over 50% of children are born today outside of marriage. 85%. This is a statistic that really touched me. 85% of prisoners grew up in a home without a father. When you go to prison, you're seeing the result of of a a lack of fathers, strong male leadership. Also, 85% of the children with behavioral disorders are from fatherless homes. 90% of the youth who run away and become homeless are from fatherless homes. Children, uh, are, children from fatherless homes are 300% more likely to carry guns and deal drugs than children who live in a home with a full-time father. So the message from the culture is that patriarchy, male leadership, is toxic. It's poisonous. And the message is it need, just needs to be destroyed. And I don't know in history if there's ever been a nation that turned against its males, against its men. I don't know of a nation in history where we said males are unnecessary to us now. We don't need them. And when a nation destroys strong male leadership, I think the result is what you're seeing right now in America, chaos, weakness, incompetent leaders, the breakdown of families, children out of control, lawlessness, irresponsible men, men who think themselves macho but are irresponsible, leave a trail of children behind and broken families and broken hearts. Sad state. Why is this? Well, let's begin and try to define what a man is because our society is struggling with this. And, of course, it depends on who you ask, doesn't it? What is a man? If I ask a scientist, he'll say, a man is a human being with XY chromosomes. If I ask a physiologist or a biologist, a male is a human with male body parts. If I ask a liberal, they'll say, any person who feels like they're a man. If I go to the gym and say, what is a man? They'll say, he has 16-inch biceps and he can bench press 250 pounds. So we can't even agree on what a man is in America anymore, can we? Mark Henry is a pastor out in Minnesota. He wrote an excellent book called The Man Code. Mark Henry's father killed himself when he was a boy. But there were a group of men who kind of took him in and Most of them were ex-military people. And he said, at 14 years old, I was in Orlando, living in Orlando, Florida with my mother, and uh, some men were in my life trying to help me. I was sitting in a garage with a group of ex-Marines, and these men would gather there, and they'd eat fish, and they would talk, and they would so on. And he said, I was fascinated as a 14-year-old boy by their battlefield stories of the past. They were obviously brave men, courageous men, strong men, extraordinary men. But when it came to the present, he said, they seemed to define masculinity. They had reduced it to drinking beer, getting drunk, seducing women, and watching sports. In their mind, that's all they ever talked about. He said, I love to hear them talk about the past. There there are exploits on the battlefield. But when they came to the present, and they began, well, what are you going to do tomorrow, and what are you doing now? It always involved drinking, women, sports. And to them, that was the whole essence of being a man. But he said, I noticed even as a boy, 
the lack of purpose that they seem to have in their life. Perhaps you've heard about the modern-day night project. I saw it the other night on TV. I just saw a glimpse about three minutes of this thing, and I picked up the name of it, and I Googled it, and it was, it's called the Modern-Day the modern Night Project. What it is is a three-day camp that turns men into alpha males. <laughs> it's modeled after Navy SEAL training. So a man goes there. He's yelled at for three days. He has to learn to do push-ups every few minutes. He carries sandbags over his head. He and his friends carry logs together. They're submerged in tubs of ice water. They crawl through the mud, and every fifth word or so is a profanity or a vulgarity. They do this and pay $18,000 for the experience. Well, can three days and $18,000 make, make you a strong man? To me, that shows the desperation that some men are feeling now in America. It's really a very, very sad thing. Soci sociologist Michael Kimmel is the supposed authority on masculinity in different cultures. He's written on it, done research extensively. He went to West Point. At West Point, he asked them, a, a group of the cadets there, if you were to do a eulogy at a funeral and you were to say he was a good man, what would you mean? And the cadets answered him thusly, I would be saying that he was a man of honor, a man of duty, a man of loyalty, integrity, sacrifice, that he was a protector and he provided for his family, that he was generous and responsible. In other words, that just about is the prototypical uh, definition you give traditionally about a man in American life. That's, that really is a good man there described. That also is the character qualities that we're trying to produce in Christian men. But then Kimmel asked that same group, but if you were to speak at the funeral and do the eulogy and you were to say he was a real man as opposed to a good man, he was a real man, what would that mean? And the cadets said it would mean he was tough, he was strong, he never showed weakness, he tried to win at any cost, he believed you just suck it up and play through the pain. Two completely different visions of a man, a good man and the real man. And those two definitions probably get pretty close to where we are and the problems that we're facing in America today with our men and our boys. And primarily, I'm preaching this for our boys. You see, when we have no definition that we can agree upon of what is masculinity, it's difficult to know and to teach our boys what it means to be a man. If over here we have the secular definition, he's tough, he's strong, he never shows weakness, he wins at any cost, he sucks it up and plays through the pain. And over here on the other side, no, a man is to have honor and duty and loyalty and integrity. He's to be willing to sacrifice. He is a protector and the provider for his family. He, he, he's generous. He's responsible. He's a good citizen. He votes. He goes to church and leads in his church. You see, two completely different visions and ideas of men. One, the media version. One, the secular version. The other, the traditional version, the version that really built America. And so, no wonder we have the problem. We don't even agree on what is a man. So, let's open our Bibles now with all of that research information and statistics that I've dumped on you here. And I know that's, I just wanted you to feel what I'm talking about. And let's go to 1 Corinthians in our Bible, because there God gives us a plan for the man. 
Here is one verse, and we're going to deal with many of them next week, but this week I'm just going to take one for the sake of time here. 1 Corinthians chapter number 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, the Apostle Paul has been writing to a church, a local church like this one, the church at Rome. And as he writes to them, he specifically decides to speak to the men in the church. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse number 13, read with me these words. Watch you, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong, and let all your things be done with charity or with love. Look at it again. What does he say to men? Watch you, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong, let all your things be done with love. Let's take them and look at them and analyze that passage for just a moment. First of all, watch. We are watchmen. Men are to be watchmen. Men are to be awake. That means simply to wake up. Sir, do you need to wake up? Does your wife ever say to you, wake up? I don't want to get into that. Let me back off of that. But I'm sure sometimes we all go to sleep, but first of all, be alert. Face reality. I, I think they call it situational awareness in the, in the military. Look around and be aware of what's happening in your environment and in your area. Don't be so preoccupied with self and your agenda, and your, your vocation, and so on, that you're not even aware of what's happening in life. Watch. Wake up. Look at your children. Look at your wife. Look at the people in your life. Be situationally aware. Face the reality. Face the truth of what, where you're living. Then, secondly, he says what? Stand firm. Stand firm. Don't waver. Don't compromise what you know is God's truth in your life. Don't do it. When you begin to compromise, you weaken your position, and before long, you don't have a position. Don't waver. Stand firm. And I I look these words up to find out the depth of meaning of them, so I know that's what that means. Stand firm, men. Don't waver. Yeah, there's a lot of pressure on you. Yeah, there's people trying, your kids are trying to get you to do things that are not good for them. Other people are trying to influence you, people at work and so on. But stand firm. And then quit you like men. But the word quit in your King James Bible, we don't use that anymore. It simply means to act like a man. That's all it means. Just act like a man. Just become in your actions, a man. Be brave is involved in that. Have courage. Show yourself a man. Two little boys walking beside a ditch. One of them jumps over the ditch. He's on the other side, and the other one is sort of now got some fear and trepidation. He's standing there looking at it. He don't know if he can get over or not. And the boy on the other side says, come on, be a man. Everybody understands that, what that means. It's not something weird. Be a man. Summon up some courage. Jump over the ditch. You can do it. Then the next word Paul says here is what? Be strong. He's not talking about going to the gym. He's talking about being spiritually strong. He's talking about being strong in your convictions, strength of the spirit, strength of the soul, having moral convictions and moral courage, facing the problems of life without, with, with fortitude, not being sniveling and complaining all the time, but being strong, having real convictions about what you believe, what is right and what is wrong. Now, that's some of those qualities even there in the real men definition I probably used, and all of those would be in the good man definition I used. But let's go on to verse 14. So he sort of balances that because he doesn't want you to just be, you know, the the macho stereotype of man. I'm just strong. I'm just firm. I'm just, you know, macho man. 
So he balances it up. And in verse 14, he says, let everything be done with love. And the word love there is the agape love, the God-like love, the, the love like Christ had, love that's unselfish, love that gives, lo- love that serves other people. It's love for God, first of all. If you're taking notes with me, I'm going to give you four of these. First of all, it's love for God. Didn't Jesus say that we're to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, our soul, and our mind? All of our heart, our soul, and our mind. That means that everything else in my life, I view it through the lens of, is this consistent with love for God? It doesn't matter. Anything else that people are saying, is, is, does the Lord approve for this? Does this show love for Him? Am I loving God with all my heart? It's an action. It's not a feeling, by the way, agape love. Number two, I think it means love for your wife. I, I know that this is not what the world is saying today, but men, you are the protector in that family, and you are to be the primary provider in that family. Now, the Bible teaches that, and I will show you that next week. I just don't have time to show you everything. I'm laying, up the, I'm, I'm laying out the big picture right now. And uh, the Bible doesn't teach that the w- women are not to work. You read Proverbs 31, that woman was a pretty savvy businesswoman. But do you know what? When it all comes down, man, you say, you know what? God put me in the place of being the protector of my family and the protector of my wife, and the spiritual leader in my home. Boy, I wish, how I wish that were true. I I watch, we have some wonderful, wonderful men who are the leaders in your home. But if you go across the country, generally speaking, it's the woman who is the spiritual leader in most homes. And she's the one who says it's time to have a reading from the Bible. She is the one who says, we haven't prayed yet. She's the one who says, we got to get up and go to church today. And it ought to be us, men. We are, ought to be the people who are saying, God is holding me responsible to be the leader in this home spiritually. I'm the prophet. I'm the priest in this home, as well as the protector and the provider in this home. Now, those are God-assigned duties. Number three, in all things, we're to show love. That's love for our children. Boy, your children need a protector today. Oh, my, they need a protector. Please, Dad, you're not letting the kids sit in that room on that video by themselves or with that phone in that back corner of the room hours at a time, and you're not monitoring that, are you? Don't be naive. There are two or three clicks from the worst stuff that the devious, evil mind of man has ever invented. There are 900,000 known porn sites in America right now. The average kid is exposed to Internet pornography when he's eight years old in America today. Eight years old. What grade is that? Fourth grade? Fifth grade? Doesn't that break your heart? Little children don't even know what that's about. And they've, you know, their friend says to them, have you seen, look here, click, click, click. Dads, we got to protect our kids against that. And they're going to think you are a bad person for telling them they can't do that. I thought one of the most interesting things I've ever read is an article about these tycoons that run Google and Microsoft and so on, who don't let their kids have cell phones. Now, they're happy with you having buying one for yours. What does an 8-year-old or a 10-year-old or a 12-year-old need a phone for? You know, our biggest problem with our school is phones. You know who the biggest problem with the phones is? Parents. Oh, we need, they'll need that to call if there's ever an emergency. I don't even want to spend time on that. 
I don't even want to spend time on that. Love your, love God, man. Love your wife, man. Love your children, man. And love others. That's a servant spirit. That's not having an, that's not having an agenda that's so full that you don't have any time to serve here in the church or to serve other people in other areas. There are lots of good things that you can serve people through. Love for others, a servant spirit. Now, I've said all of this, and boy, I've thrown the, the data at you today. I know I have, but I, I, I want you to grasp this issue. I want to I close with this one, and I really want you to get it. A man named Brad Wilcox is associated with the Heritage Foundation. Many of you are familiar with that. He wrote a book called Soft Patriarchs. Here's what he said. Here's what he discovered. Men who are religiously devout. Now, here's how he defines being religiously devout. They're theologically conservative, so we'll just say they believe the Bible, okay? Men who are religiously devout, who believe the Bible and who attend church three times a month. Now, that's not a real high standard because you didn't deal with anything else. Just do they believe the Bible, and do they go to church three times a month? Men like that are the most loving to their wives, the most emotionally engaged with their children, the least likely to divorce, and they have the lowest levels of domestic violence and abuse of any other demographic he studied. Now, he, he, he divided men into demographics. He had mainline Protestants. He had Roman Catholics. He had blacks. He had whites. He had wealthy. He had middle class. He had poor. He took all these demographics. But of all the demographics, men who genuinely believe the Bible and go to church at least three times a month are the most loving to their wives of all the other demographics, most emotionally engaged, least likely to divorce, and have the lowest levels of domestic violence and abuse. But here's the stinger. This is what really got my attention. Nominal evangelical men. These are men who identify with the church. I grew up at the Baptist temple to bring it home. I grew up at the Baptist temple, but I don't go to church anymore, or I go really regularly. And Men who identify with the church because of family or cultural background, but who attend infrequently or not at all, their families are the worst off of any other demographic. Their wives are the unhappiest. Their marriages are the least stable. Whereas active Christian men are less likely to divorce than secular men, nominal Christian men are 20% more likely to, to divorce than secular men. Do you get that? And active evangelical Christian men have the lowest rate of domestic violence, 2.8%, while nominal evangelical Christian men have the highest rate 7.2%, even higher than secular couples. What does it say? It says if you really believe your Bible and you're active in your church's life, your family is going to be a happier, more emotionally healthy family, both your wife and your children, and you are going to be happier. But it says if you are just the kind of guy, yeah, I believe that, but you know, I'm not very important to you, grew up in a church, but uh, attends sporadically, if at all, and, and don't live out your faith in your life, you've got the worst problem. The people who are secular, their families fare better than the families of nominal Christians. Isn't that, that what a challenge to us? We talked about that in the staff of the day. We were all just, we couldn't believe it. And yet we could see it. Chris Edwards said, you know what? Every time I see a, a, a kid really just go completely off the rails, almost it's because there's not a dad involved. If there's a dad even in the home, 
The dad is preoccupied with other stuff, and so the child doesn't have the father's love and that father's guidance and hand in his life. Let's go back to where we started. I sought for a man. The wall is broken down. The hedges are broken down. I sought for a man among them that would make up the hedge and stand in the gap and keep the evil out. But I found none. Oh, I found a lot of guys who'd say, yeah, I'll stand in the gap, but they're not there. They're not there when the invaders start to come. God wants men, needs men. Will you be God's man? Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed.